Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Introduction to Terraform on AWS. But I have it on good authority by Kevin that it will be a gentle introduction. So um, if you haven't had the pleasure of, have, of having Kevin as your instructor or your webinar leader, you're in for a treat. Um, he's a very seasoned instructor. And he also just told me he has he has, teaches 150 different classes. So here we go. This is just one though. Um, my name is Anne on, and on behalf of Excel Instructor-Led Training, I'd like to welcome you here and thank you so much for coming. But just in case you don't know who we are, we are Accelerate, Exit Certified and WebAge Solutions. And among the three of our brands, we've got about 60 years of tr IT training experience, which is really good news for you because we can share all of our resources, our instructors, um, curriculum, certifications, and anything else that you need for training. We have a couple little nuances. Accelerate um, concentrates on customized courses for teams. Exit Certified has all the vendor authorized certification courses. WebAge Solutions does upskilling programs for entire organizations. And Exit Certified and WebAge also do live public courses for individuals. And we do teach a lot of classes. Um, of course, AWS, Terraform, bunch of different ones. And it doesn't matter which one of us you get in touch with, we will lead you to the right place to get the training that you need. And speaking of training that you probably need, um, we do have an automation with Terraform and AWS EKS training um, coming up for a public virtual course. It's running December 9th. And you will get 60% off if you would like to sign up for that. So it's just $249 for the day. It is live, instructor-led, hands-on. I will put that URL in the chat. I know it's a long one, but that's where you can go to check it out and possibly enroll if you'd like to. If that course doesn't suit your time, your, your date requirement, or you'd like uh, a private class, you can still get 25% off with the promo code TRAIN25, and I will put that in the chat as well. Um, and by the way, this session is being recorded, so you will all get a copy of this later on. All right, but first, um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Kevin, if you don't already know him. Um, Kevin has 35 years of experience in tech, and did I mention that he teaches over 150 classes? Um, he's helped organizations of all size optimize their IT infrastructure. He has a deep knowledge of cloud. He understands cloud environments, um, of course, IAC. Um, he's the perfect person to be giving this webinar because he's so deep into AWS, and, and he's also a Terraform trainer. Um, but he's also very well-rounded because he knows Python, databases, um, big data, you name it. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. And Kevin, I will turn this over to you. Oh, and you are muted, just FYI. There yep. you go. Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, thanks, Anne. I appreciate the uh, the introduction and welcome everybody. Uh, we have kind of a quick agenda today uh, in an hour's time to give you kind of insight into what uh, Terraform is capable uh, of doing um, and also to talk about some of the generalized concepts. I will be doing a demo of this so we get a chance to see deploying an EC2 instance. If we have a little bit more time, uh, you know, we may even see some additional um, opportunities here to to show off uh, how Terraform works and really what the, the purpose uh, of Terraform is. Uh, so uh, again, you know, bear with us as we're going through. We'll, we'll talk about a number of these features and functionalities. And, and I think it will make sense to everybody by the time we get uh, towards the end. Uh, but I do encourage you to ask questions uh, if there is anything in particular that you're interested in knowing more about. Uh, so from a concept point of view, let's let's start there. Uh, let's talk about infrastructure as code. The idea behind infrastructure as code is that we're not sitting there working with the console in AWS directly, uh, trying to manipulate it to you know get it to do whatever we want. Uh, that's the biggest issue that uh, I think a lot of people have um, when when they're dealing with uh, these environments is it does take a long time to get the environment up running and prepared. If we can turn that over uh, and provide a mechanism uh, for this, 
uh, via some kind of tool that can give us a couple of uh, insights uh, to to make things more manageable uh, for the organization uh, itself. IAC tools have been around for a while. Uh, maybe you've worked with Chef or Puppet. Maybe you've worked with some of the other things like CloudFormation. Uh, maybe you've not worked with any of that, and and that's okay. Uh, as I said, you know we can go from the console approach. The console approach means we're coming here uh, inside of AWS. We're going to get logged in. We're going to go to our EC2 instance, and we're going to manually launch it. And, and that means that we need to kind of know all of the details behind uh, what needs to be put into uh, these forms. And, and that's really what it's about, what needs to go into the form. The idea is once we go through this process, we have uh, the ability to have an instance available to us uh, up and running, right? That's kind of the, the idea. What is an instance? It's a VM, right? A VM. So what am I going to do on that VM? Well, I'm probably going to think about installing or operating with maybe a database, maybe some additional code, uh, some kind of app that I want to run. The problem with that is if I get any of that incorrect, uh, it's the time to debug and fix it that, that's going to be critical to my organization. If I need an instance up and running, I generally need it up and running now. So if I can provision that and successfully do that over and over again, that's where infrastructure as code is really going to give us the insight uh, for what we really need to do. Now, we're talking about AWS in this environment today, but we could be deploying this on Azure. We could deploy it on uh, Google Cloud, for that matter. Uh, we could deploy it on-prem, and it could be VMs that we're using on-prem. In our environment, since we're focused on kind of AWS, we're talking about elastic cloud compute, right? So the EC2 uh, compute environment. HashiCorp has all kinds of information that you can learn about uh, from their, their actual websites. Uh, you know, Terraform IO here is essentially where you would go uh, if you're looking for more uh, information about that. I'll put that in the chat if anybody wants to follow along. Uh, once we're here though, we need to kind of set up our environment. So the first thing that you would typically do would be to download uh, Terraform. Uh, you would download it from uh, the environment here. You would pick the specific version that you want to run uh, on your local machine. And that could be a, a Windows machine. It could be a Mac machine. It could be a Linux machine. It supports all of those uh, different OSs. And, and as such, uh, you would install it. And you can see that you know, the installation is done in, in different ways, depending on the environment that you're working with. All right, so let's say that we've got that set up, we're ready to go, now what? Well, we said that we wanted to provision uh, an EC2 instance and get it set up and running, right? So the idea of getting that resource set up uh, remotely and those services available. But there's more than just provisioning the instance. There's a lot of behind scene things that need to be configured as well. If we think about the cloud environment kind of being a container, and again, you know, bear with me on that term because it does mean something else if we're talking about Kubernetes and Docker, but a container of services, that's really what we're talking about. Inside of the VPC, the virtual private cloud, we set up our instances to run. And as I said, one of those might be that uh, cloud compute. It might be a database. It might be a web server. It could be Kubernetes in itself that we would uh, want to deploy and manage maybe many Docker containers. Each of these are things that we need to think about. In Terraform, we refer to the resource as uh, the instance and we refer to its individual pieces, in other words, the configuration pieces by code. And you can see it's pretty simple here. Uh, in this example that we're seeing, we say resource AWS underscore instance, and then we give it a name, EC2-T2-West2. Why the name? Well, if we're deploying thousands of these, Right? We need to have a way of uniquely identifying them. That name will actually end up 
in our instance name here on AWS right here. We will get a generated instance ID that will be generated by AWS. Each of those will be unique. That's something that we can pull back in Terraform. We'll see that a little bit later. We can have our instance state, right? It's going to be up or uh, not up, right? Running uh, instance or maybe terminated instance if it's something that we've stopped later on. Uh, we're going to have the instance types uh, and so on. This is all going to happen because of the resource that is sitting in our .tf file. That's as simple as I can talk about when it comes to configuring something uh, as you, know, you, you really need to understand. It's a declarative instance. So what kinds of things can we declare? Here's an example beyond just the resource of other information that we typically declare inside of Terraform. So the first thing that we do is we say the provider that we want to use, in this case, AWS. As I said, it could be Azure, could be Google, could be something else. There's many different providers available today, uh, and you can certainly go out and look at those uh, at Terraform. We need to so set the version. We need to set up the region that we want to deploy the instance to. And again, this could be done um, directly in the code as we're seeing here. It could also be set up with variables that we read in. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, here in the class. And then finally, we've got our resource and maybe we even give it a, you know, a special tag that we can look up later on where all of the resources of this type have that tag and we can treat them as a group or you know, however we want to uh, provision them uh, as that resource in the cloud. Those are important details, but the most important part is if we're looking at deploying an EC2 instance, the resource with uh, the type, and of course, uh, the AMI. Uh, the AMI or Amazon Machine Image is simply a virtual machine that uh, pre-exists on uh, our uh, environment. Now, this could be our own, or it could be an AMI that's uh, already available from, from Amazon. That means that we could work with many different types here, uh, depending on our requirements. Uh, when we were looking at that screen at a AWS earlier, which is right here, you can see that there are a bunch of different instance types. In fact, uh, Today, there's actually over 8,000 instance types that we can choose from. We could also upload our own, uh, which is more likely uh, given you know, the world today, we probably would configure our own environment uh, for whatever we uh, are trying to do. But you can see here um, you know, the, the different AMI types and each of them have a unique identifier. So that's the unique identifier that we're using here. And then the other part of that would be the, the type of instance that we would want to run. There are many types, as you're probably well aware in AWS. Uh, in our case, you know, we're just playing with a micro type for this demo, but we could certainly, uh, you know, look at any of the uh, additional, and believe me, there are a lot of them, uh, depending on our needs. Right. If we're working with big data, we're going to want to have something with a lot of memory uh, so that we can load uh, the data into memory. If we're working with a relational database, we're going to want to have a lot of CPU and memory available. So we would choose the type that would be appropriate for uh, the deployment that we have. That essentially, once we have this information, we can start down the road of uh, essentially running our application. And we're going to run that application right in our local machine. To do that, we need to have some kind of connection to, to AWS. Uh, so again, through permissions that we would be garnered uh, using IAM, uh, again, identity access management in AWS, our user would be able to set up the desired file. Uh, they would actually be able to uh, apply that resource as defined, and then uh, deploy that uh, to the to the cloud environment. Um, it, in, again, in our case, AWS. Those pieces are very important, and the steps to do so are also very important uh, to to understand. So, as I said, I was going to demo as we're going along. 
So the idea is that I create my desired file here, again, with the resource, maybe modules that I need. I run it and it creates a state file. This is the most important thing that I think people overlook when it comes to uh, Terraform. And, and that is that Terraform can generate a file that keeps track of everything that you've deployed. If you think about that from the other perspective, I go out and, and I use uh, you know, the management tool and I do stuff. I don't have any place that I'm collecting that information uh, about what is deployed. Right? I have to go back to the console. I have to look in the console. I have to find the items. Maybe I have to search for uh, the different EC2 instances. And, and that can take a lot of time, especially if it's something that I need to update or especially if it's something that is problematic right now in my uh, you know, deployments. Maybe I'm getting errors on something. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to go through and find all of those instances, uh, go in, uh, make the changes manually to them for every instance that's running. In the case of having the Terraform state, I have a single location that tells me everything that's been deployed in my instances. If there's something that I need to change, I can go into my HCL file, the file that I showed you there a moment ago, pardon me, uh, and I can make that change. So I could go here and update this AMI, redeploy this, and it would update all of the instances with that server tag uh, that are in the field. That's the beauty of, of working with this. So not only are we having a single location to deploy as many instances as we want, we put another line in here and say how much count of that that we want. In other words, how many we want. Uh, maybe we want 10. All I do is set the count to 10. Now I have 10 unique instances that are identical to each other. Um, one place to make the change, one place to update all of the uh, events that are running, in this case, uh, the servers that would be running, and that information stored long-term for me to track. Where can I put that? Well, we can put that into a GitHub or GitLab or even store it in uh, one of the repos inside of AWS. So we have the ability now of having that Terraform state shared with others as well. So as a team, maybe we've got a bunch of folks that are part of that deployment for the production side. They can all access the exact same relevant information to make that change. So a central repo with that information is kind of the bonus that we get here uh, by uh, taking this approach. So, right, so once we apply it. Now, we should probably do that, right? I said I was going to demo it as we're going to go. So here is the file that we want to use. Uh, you'll notice that this is uh, sitting under Terraform AWS instance, and this file is actually called main.tf. Uh, so that's just the name of, of my file that I'm going to use. And we can actually do this. I'm going to do it from the command line just to show you. I could also do it there in Visual Studio Code, but sometimes it's nicer to see. Uh, so this is the, the actual uh, folder in which that file exists. So let me go over to that. Uh, Terraform uh, dash AWS, and I should be able to hit, uh, whoops, if I type everything correctly, uh, I should be able to hit tab here, uh, Terraform and AWS, oh, whoops, that went to the wrong folder, let me go back one, CD Terraform dash AWS dash instance, there we go. Uh, so if I do a DIR, you can see in here, um, I have my main.tf. That's all I have is that individual file uh, that we saw uh, here on the main screen. All right, what do I need to do? So the first thing that you do is once you've installed Terraform locally, you can initialize this folder and pull down the resources required to work with whatever uh, instance uh, information that you are providing in the, the main file. So in our case, we are going to do Terraform init like this. Uh, and what it's going to do is read through the main file. It's going to pick up the resources that are required, and it's going to install them. 
So essentially, in this dot Terraform folder, it's now installed the requirements for me to work with an EC2 instance. In other words, the modules. Okay, now what do I do? Well, probably want to validate uh, this instance to make sure everything is okay. So we can validate our file and that's going to check the modules as well at the same time. Look at that. It says the configuration is valid. I'm very happy. Uh, so we can continue on. What's next? Well, I may want to know what is going to change between what I am writing here and essentially what is deployed out here in AWS. And right now we can see that there is nothing deployed in AWS, right? No, um, no instances running, nothing available. So the plan is going to tell me what's going to change. We should see a lot of pluses coming up here in a moment uh, on the screen. It's going to show me the difference between what is in my file and what is uh, deployed currently uh, in the AWS instance. Uh, and it does that check, um, as I said, both locally and in that environment. Now, to do that check, it has to have my credentials, uh, my permissions, uh, and those have to be locally as well. So those were pre-installed prior uh, to me starting this class, but essentially I have that, um, that user set up uh, and I have that um, information available. So it will go through and plan that for me. It will figure out what the differences are uh, between my local instance and uh, the instance in uh, the, the cloud environment. Uh, so the idea with, with AWS here uh, yes, exactly. The AZ login is used in Azure. So on AWS, we use the AWS CLI uh, uh, for that purpose. And, and essentially, it will go through. Uh, yep. So AWS. Thank you, Miles. Uh, Miles put that in there. Um, if you are, are talking about the AWS uh, CLI, you need to know how to kind of work with it. If I type AWS here at the command prompt, you're going to see it gives me a bunch of suggestions for the commands that I can run. Uh, those commands are going to be, um, you know, kind of straightforward uh, when it comes to that environment. Uh, you know, for instance, I could say AWS S3 LS. Uh, I don't have any uh, buckets currently. Uh, maybe we can demo that too. Uh, but that would be essentially how I would um, uh, create that and uh, uh, run it uh, as such. Uh, so again, just something to uh, to to be aware of. But the idea, as I said, in in the main component is that um, we we can start that up. We can run it. It's going to give us um, some kind of uh, output. Uh, from the, this environment to to work with uh, the instances uh, in the cloud. But those permissions are uh, essentially there. So we've got our AWS uh, account set up. Uh, as I said, we installed Terraform. We've got our configured credentials. Again, those would have to have permission to work with those uh, resources, to, depending on uh, again, the resources that I'm looking at using. And then once that, that is uh, kind of done, I have this ability to run some of these commands, you know, that we're, that we're talking about. So the idea of um, initializing uh, the folder, installing the modules that are required, the idea of validating uh, my individual uh, code, in, in this case, the main uh, .tf code uh, that I showed you, and then from there, you know, applying and showing and, and, and so on, um, you know, whatever whatever we need to do. Uh, for this particular uh, application. And, and this application, of course, is our uh, our Terraform instance itself. So the, the Terraform uh, essentially apply uh, will allow us to then uh, apply this instance uh, to our remote uh, operations and uh, have something deployed into uh, AWS. It's the simplest way to do it uh, today. It's not the only way, as I said earlier. Uh, there are certainly other things that, that we can do uh, when it comes to um, you know working with Terraform and uh, the, having Terraform interact with um, our operations. But uh, essentially, we we have the ability to run this. I just realized that my Norton server is uh, complaining here, so let me go and and grab this and and start it um 
essentially in the background. I think it's actually hiding behind my application here. Hang on a second, folks. What it's um, what it's asking me to do uh, because I have a a, a Norton interface running, uh, it's asking me to uh, give permission uh, to that system uh, to be able to to run. So that's essentially what was um, what was happening there. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, now that I've given permission to that. Uh, we should be able to see the uh, the instance running over here. Uh, so I'm going to say yes, that I wanted to perform these actions. Uh, I started it here so that you can see this. So these are all of the pluses that I was talking about. So you can see each of them are uh, going to be added. Some of these things will not be known until after they are created on AWS, we'll, we'll get that information shortly. Uh, but the idea is that we apply these changes and we tell it, yes, go ahead and, and doing uh, do this for us. Uh, so you can see it's starting to create uh, our app server. Uh, so the plan was done. I've now done uh, Terraform apply. And eventually what should happen is we should see uh, this be updated with uh, the EC2 resource uh, uh, running. Uh, of course, I have to make sure I'm in the same region, which I'm not. Uh, so there we go. Uh, so here under EC2, we should see that um, uh, that deployment. And it should have an ID of uh, this. So there it is. Yep, my server. There's the ID. Uh, matches my uh, FF4 ID here. So this is the server that we just started running. Uh, and it's now available for us. To look at we can find out details about it as well uh, so if i didn't um well there's a couple of ways of doing this let's do uh, let's do the terraform show so terraform show uh, goes out and asks terraform what is the difference uh, or what have you set up for me remotely uh, so i've run show here on the command line uh, you can see there's the uh, ami that we requested you can see it's running in us west uh, 2B, which is, of course, the um, uh, warehouse server uh, database uh, area, right? An EC2, it, in this case, it would be uh, one of the main, many available uh, environments, uh, and that's allocated in, in their environment for us. Uh, and we can see information about what's running. We've got some additional information about the IP addresses uh, and so on. Um, and this is a, a way of doing it. Yeah, Michael, I'm doing both. Uh, I'm actually showing it here in my command prompt, but I'm also showing it here uh, directly in the terminal in uh, Visual Studio Code. Some people like one or the other. Uh, I like to show kind of both going on. Uh, so yeah, you can see how uh, this has provisioned uh, the instance based on uh, the information. And we can show, you know, kind of the, the information here. Uh, again, Everybody kind of has different preferences on how they like to see it. I prefer it in the terminal, but uh, sometimes it's harder to see because if I do the same command with uh, Terraform show here, right, it, it's going to go off my screen pretty quick. Uh, and then I, you know, kind of have to scroll up, but it's the exact same command that I ran um, here uh, as well. Uh, so that's just one of the, the ways that, that we can work with with Terraform and, and set things up. Um, we could do things with, uh, somebody asked about VPC. Uh, so again, we could do the same thing with the VPC. I have a VPC here. So if you go to the, um, the folder with, with VPC in it, we can see what that looks like. So this is, uh, again, a VPC with a region resource for IAM. Uh, again, with VPC IPAN set up, and we've got some uh, IP pools here, as you can see. Again, it would be the exact same process. We would run a plan, and once we run the plan, uh, then you know we can deploy it. We'd want to make sure that the reason we do the plan first is essentially we're making sure that anything that we're running 
fits into uh, the requirements. So it, it's using the right version and so on. You can see here, uh, it's complaining on this one about a lock. And, and that's because I ran the other one uh, first. So I, I can't run them simultaneously. I need to finish, you know, kind of the first one that I was doing before I go to the next one. Um, that's a pretty common scenario, uh, whether it's here in Terraform or whether it's here in um, any of the other deployments, right? You need to kind of finish what you were doing. So over here, we we did deploy our, our main um, TF. Uh, one of the other things that we can do is once that resource is, is up and running, you know, depending on what we're doing, where we're doing it, we can remove that resource uh, as well. So it's pretty common after, you know, maybe a, a while that your instances are running, maybe you want to replace them, you'll run replacement commands. Maybe you even want to take them down uh, entirely. So in Terraform, we do have the ability to run what's called Terraform Destroy. Uh, and using Terraform Destroy, it reads basically the TF state information here. Uh, and it starts to disable uh, essentially the resources uh, that we have in play. Uh, if I go back to the folder, since we didn't um, actually see that, if I go back here and I look at the uh, the Terraform state file, this is something I, I shouldn't change. Oh, it's not going to let me do it in this editor. Uh, hang on. Uh, we could we could go in and, and look at it. It's because I'm in the process of destroying it that it won't let me see it. But essentially, the the state file uh, contains that that information uh, that we would have, and it does it over time. So over time, the the Terraform state file will get updated uh, with different information. This is an example, uh, and that information is then used for uh, removing the resource, which we are are doing here. And again, we could run that in Visual Studio Code. We could run it here in the command line. Uh, it could be run as a script from some other location as well. Maybe we're going to use, uh, you know, Python to uh, to start the instances up and so on, or, you know, .NET or Java. All of those uh, can certainly run and, and uh, call these scripts that are, are pre-created uh, in, in Terraform. Uh, but that's essentially, uh, you know, what we're, what we're up to. So, uh, again, um, don't know if, if we're sharing these uh, with you, but uh, my plan was to share the uh, the information with you so we can make sure that we put together a package and uh, send it out with, with all of the slides and the information. Uh, I've put a lot of information in, in the slide information as well for you uh, as notes. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the idea. Uh, as you're going through and, and deploying it, you set up kind of this main TF. Uh, you can also set up uh, essentially references to variables where you might have things that you want to change. And in your main, uh, it can reference that information. So for instance, here, I might specify uh, a variable for the AMI instance that I want to run, uh, which is here. And this variable AMI can be called into uh, the main process as well. And this is a pretty common way of doing it. We, we generally have kind of the structure uh, in the main TF file, and then uh, we will put uh, additional modules in to do, uh, you know, various operations, depending on what our requirements are with Terraform. Uh, this gives us, of course, the uh, ability to start um, manipulating and making changes in a single location but able to use this as a way of having deployments for many, 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 uh, you know, in this case, EC2 instances, uh, as I said, with the count information, now I can deploy two or three or five or 10. And if I need to update them, I have a single location where I can make the change for the AMI type that I want to update to um, at a later date. Um, so it makes it fairly easy to work with these blocks uh, things like resources, things like variables, uh, other types of modules uh, that we would use in uh, in Terraform. Uh, deploying the EC2 instance, as we mentioned, so we create the .tf file. That was the main .tf file that you saw. We initialize it, which 
pulls down the provider modules. So whatever I'm talking about using in as resources, it pulls down the specific resources uh, for that. Uh, and then I can plan the deployment and apply the deployment. Uh, as we said, those are the main pieces that we have um, for that. Uh, depending on our requirements, we will write that file uh, specifically for the needs of, of the deployment that we're working on. So here in our main file, you know, that's where um, that information came from. And uh, again, in the Terraform side of things, if we look at the provider information, uh, here we we can look at information specifically that that would be given to us. Uh, these are exe files, for instance, as you can see, it's downloading uh, the one for AWS and for the instance version uh, that I asked for. I'm not going to go and open that, uh, but but essentially it downloads that information. Uh, all installed when I did the uh, init command, so Terraform init uh, for that. Uh, with regards to uh, deploying other things, what else can we, uh, you know, work with? Uh, there's pretty much a plethora of um, items that that are possible for deploying. Uh, so the idea here in uh, uh, this environment, we can pick up uh, well over 175 different resources on AWS. That's 175. Uh, services that you're probably aware of, uh, everything from RDS, uh, everything uh, through Lambda functions. Uh, somebody mentioned VPC. Uh, we can do EKS. I'm going to show a, an example of that coming up momentarily. Um, but as each resource gets deployed, uh, we're going to track that in that TF state. So that version control uh, essentially allows us to keep track of that. Uh, that can be, as I said, pushed to Git or GitHub or you know wherever you you want, whatever your repo is, and then that can be shared with others. Um, one of the things I've seen recently that that people are using Terraform for is they don't know what's deployed. They have many many things out there, um, and you can use Terraform to sync with what's currently deployed. Pull down a, a essentially a, a file that will contain all of that deployment resource. Uh, and then you can go through that and kind of push that out into uh, TF files and recreate essentially what uh, what you've done uh, in that cloud environment, which is kind of a, a different approach, right? Uh, but uh, certainly is an approach that would save a, a team that's trying to track uh, essentially what's been deployed in the cloud a, a lot quicker, right? It, that's something that that often happens. The other thing that will happen is you get drift. So somebody has gone in manually, they've made a change to the EC2 instance, and it differs from what I have on the original state file. Uh, what I can do is have my state file get updated, uh, and then uh, I could redeploy essentially what that change was to the other servers if there were more than one uh, servers that were being managed or the opposite of that, I can say, hey, you know, you shouldn't have made that change. I'm going to redeploy my state file as is, and it's going to set it back to where it should be. So there's a, you know, kind of a, a different way that people are now thinking about using Terraform beyond just managing the deployment uh, initially, but it's maintaining it, you know, over the long term uh, as well. Uh, so this is something to to think about. Version control is just one of the many things that we can get from this, but the reproduction uh, and consistency of the system over time is, is certainly another thing that we want to think about. Uh, and then, as you saw a moment ago, uh, with the count side of things, I can start to scale out many resources that are equivalent to each other uh, from one file. So this gives me that automation uh, when I do need to scale uh, to maybe, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday coming up, I need a thousand machines that are identical. I can do that in one line inside of the config file. I'm not going through and clicking new instance, <laughs> new instance, uh, new instance, make an instance of this type, you know, in the console, uh, which can be tricky in itself or from the CLI command line, which is even worse. Uh, because of the the notation that you would have to use, it would be quite uh, quite unmanageable. 
the other thing that we see in this is obviously the the idea of cost optimization. So one of the efficiencies that we pick up is that we we now know how many instances are configured and deployed. It's based on what we've done in the file. Terraform will maintain that. So if an instance goes down, Terraform will ensure that, you know, those instances are uh, scaled back up. There's all kinds of other things that are happening in the background for us. Uh, but it also gives us that cost optimization that we mentioned where we can set a budget and say, okay, we want to stay within a specific range here for the budget uh, by using, you know, CloudWatch and CloudTrail and some other pieces, uh, we can... Uh, use Terraform in a way to manage those devices uh, effectively, uh, which is, uh, again, something that we we are very, very concerned about uh, in the long term. Uh, remember, we said about the the credentials, so the idea of um, your, your credentials, you're going to go into your IAM settings, you're going to make sure that your user account that is set up here has the proper credentials to be able to work with the resources uh, that you're using. It has the proper rules and policies. Obviously, I'm not going to go over that. This is not a class on that. Uh, but we could certainly do that. And, and we do discuss it inside of the Terraform classes that we do run about the permissions that are going to be required, how you set those up. Uh, again, that's going to be tied into the type of resources uh, that you're going to utilize uh, overall, right? So each of these, uh, you know, would be thought about in in different ways. Uh, maybe you want to deploy a bucket. Maybe you want to deploy, uh, you know, something else. Uh, again, it's a matter of knowing how to go about it. And, you know, you're going to come here and create the bucket. You're going to put in the bucket name. You're going to fill in all of these forms. Why do that? Right? That takes a lot of time to go through. And by the way, each bucket has to be unique. So how are you going to maintain that? Uh, the better way of doing it would be to, to pick this up, uh, as I said earlier, uh, through code. Right, So we don't want to do it necessarily from um, writing this individually uh, in going through and figuring out that information. We want to do it uh, via code. And we want to get that instance up and running it as quick as possible and probably want to remove it as quick as possible. So if we can do that inside of something like uh, our Terraform code here in Visual Studio, this is going to be a, a useful way of doing it. Again, we set up the resource and the provider for the region that we want. We look at what it is that we want to deploy. I'm going to deploy a bucket called uh, my S3TF bucket demo. Uh, and then inside of that bucket, I'm going to put a file, right? That's typically what we want to do. We want to set up a bucket. We want to upload a file to the bucket and have it available. That bucket file is going to be referenced here in my folder. So while I'm creating this, I can also say what bucket objects I want to deploy uh, immediately uh, in that environment. Again, to do that, I need to go into the folder where I've got the, the file, right? So there it is, data, and uh, in this case, s3.tf. You don't have to call it that. You could call it main if you want. I generally give them names that make sense, and you can have quite a long name, up to 256 characters. Uh, we've made it very Brief here in this example is s3.tf, but it could be anything. Remember, we ran the Terraform init first. That's going to use our credentials as well as the information in the file to go out to Terraform, pull down the modules that are required for this particular resource. S3 bucket and S3 bucket object. These are the two that are required to work with a bucket and also to deploy uh, data inside of that bucket, in this case, our index.html file. Again, we can do the Terraform plan. So again, I'm going back through those uh, examples that I showed a moment ago. So Terraform plan, it's going to give me a whole bunch of pluses on the changes that I'm going to be making here. Uh, on that remote resource versus what I have locally, right? So that's that's the difference, what I have locally versus what's in the remote resource. Uh, again, I've got to go and, sorry. The updated in the last week or so, 
Norton and it's getting really annoying uh, because it wants to come up and uh, uh, basically get in my way every every time I try to do something. Uh, I'll leave it up for a moment. Um, so here we've just basically gone through. This is the information. You can see the versioning and so on going on. Uh, we haven't got the IDs yet, right? Because we haven't deployed it. But when we do deploy it, so going back here, apply. Now it's going to ask me, are you sure you want to deploy this? I'm going to say yes. Uh, we can do that automatically so we don't have to be prompted every time, but sometimes that's a good thing to check, right? Uh, and it's starting to create the buckets uh, in that remote resource. We may get an error uh, depending on what we're trying to do. Uh, the specified bucket does not exist, it says. Okay, so it's probably just a, a, a location where we've updated the information but haven't um, actually got the bucket there yet. There it is. So that worked. Yeah. So in the in the process of that, uh, we we can put in um, uh, basically a set time for it to do one and then the next. In my case, it, it it's doing both at the same time. So we'll see if once we've got the bucket there. Yeah. There we go. So now uh, it says that it, it did it successfully. Uh, again, it depends on what, what we're trying to do and, and how we're trying to do it and the order that we're trying to do it. But eventually it got the index.html file there. Again, same thing. Once we are done with that, we can go and destroy it. So here, destroying the resource, uh, removing it, and so on. Uh, this is essentially what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm not showing the credential file because that would be a violation. Uh, the second I show you the credential file, um, I, I would have to, uh, you know, call AWS and say, hey, you know, I've, I've shown people my unique secret credential file, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to do that. But yeah, the credential files are generated in IAM for a user. And again, if you don't know how to do that or you want to know more, we've got lots of great courses on that. Miles has also put in information about how you go about configuring that. Uh, you type AWS configure, uh, and you can set up the region uh, and so on. But again, I, I can't show you that. Obviously, that would be uh, a violation, and I'm uh, not going to do that here in the class. All right, uh, so what just happened? I said destroy. So let's go see if the bucket's still here. Nope. <laughs> so again, if I go out here and do a quick refresh on the screen, you can see we've now removed the bucket. So it's, it's that simple in, in managing resources, um, especially here. Uh, we can destroy them, remove them. We can update them. Um, you know, pretty simple way of of working with this. Um, and uh, again, it's really up to you where where you want to run uh, these kinds of operations uh, in order to uh, uh, to see um, you know the the setups that are being done. All right. So, what are some of the next next steps uh, for you? You know, it'd be go out and, and learn a little bit about it. There's some great tutorials out there, or you know, join us for a class uh, that we run here. Uh, and again, they, those run quite frequently, uh, not only on AWS but uh, Azure and in Google Cloud. Uh, we certainly have the capabilities of uh, walking you through that. I do want to open the session to see if there's any questions. Uh, we're about uh, 10 minutes before the end. Uh, and I can run a, a more uh, higher level demo if somebody wants to see a, you know, a larger deployment. We can certainly do that. Um, is Terraform preferred over CDK? That's a great um, question, uh, John Henry. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I also teach the AWS CDK classes so just to give you an idea uh, of coding differences, so let's look at um, this example of just deploying an S3 bucket, right? Uh, we've got, what, 33 lines of code to deploy a bucket. That's it, okay? So since you asked, let's go and look at deploying, uh, let's use the Python one because that, that's even simpler code. Uh, so here is deploying a bucket with Python. We could do this with um, Java. We could do this with 
uh, .NET technically today. Uh, mostly Python and JavaScript are used because Node is, is typically the way that we, we would do that over here in, in Python. All right, so here's the equivalent in CDK of um, deploying a, a file to a bucket. Uh, first off, I have to import all of the Python libraries, uh, and it's even worse uh, if I'm working in, in JavaScript. Uh, I have to set up the clients. I have to set up my uh, app stack because this is going to use CloudFormation to do that, uh, which is essentially creating a stack on AWS. And by the way, you pay for that being maintained and run every time. Uh, it's then going to push out the bucket. So there's the bucket code. Uh, we then need to move the data. So down here, uh, this is essentially where we're going to define the files to upload. I have a bunch of them here that are being uploaded. Uh, and then I need to run the code in order to, uh, to set that up, which is back here. So we probably have about 110, 150 lines of code here just for uh, deploying the bucket. So I think that you know should give you a kind of the difference between them. I'm happy to do both of them to train people in both of them uh, because there's different needs, right? So uh, in the case of using something like the CDK, the idea is that this is something that I want to set up and have run over and over and over again. Maybe I'm going to do it on a schedule. Uh, maybe I'm going to have it triggered by uh, something going in the bucket. In the case of Terraform, I'm setting up the bucket and I'm pushing the, the file, but I'm not really doing anything additional to that. I would need to set up Lambda functions that would then look for my bucket and would do the same thing, trigger or schedule um, you know, the buckets to get, get updated. So there's different reasons for using a, a CDK approach than using uh, the Terraform approach. Does that answer your, your question? That was kind of the, the idea um, behind it uh, overall is that there are, you know, different reasons for, um, for, for choosing between them. Uh, I hope that answers your, your, your question, uh, John Henry. Uh, it, it really would depend on what the requirements are in, in the organization and, and why you're doing something specifically uh, for that. Uh, the other thing I said, I would show you a kind of a larger example so let me show you, uh, just before we wrap up today, uh, a larger example of this. This is actually the class that's um, coming up uh, in December, uh, where you're going to build out an EKS uh, instance. And uh, this will give you kind of an idea of where you would be headed over the time uh, of taking the class and learning about these pieces. Uh, you can see that there's actually four pieces here that are used uh, because this is obviously a larger deployment that I'd want to do in a clustered environment uh, where I'm deploying uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, so here at the highest level, I actually have the defined AWS uh, VPC, so the virtual private cloud, that container where I'm going to load up all of my uh, information and the ports and so on that I'm going to set up along with the, uh, the IP addresses uh, down here, I start to uh, set up the node groups. These are going to be used to run different types of uh, Kubernetes servers. So the EKS is going to run EC2 instances or serverless instances. Uh, we can see that there's um, some additional policy information that needs to be set up for the cluster, like giving it a name. Uh, some of these are coming in as variables uh, because it's easier to manage. So one of the things I could do is set up the region variable. Uh, in Terraform, I might have a specific one for the Terraform uh, pieces that I want to use. So the Terraform TF is, is pretty common for this. Um, and again, you know, combining all of these things and then initializing this, uh, I could go ahead and uh, deploy it. One of the ways of doing that, as I said earlier, is directly in the terminal. So here I would go ahead and say Terraform, again, init because it's, it's going to allow me to download uh, all of that information uh, for the modules that are required. So the VPC modules, the EC2 modules, uh, the EKS modules, as you can see, it's just installing the EKS module right there on that command line. 
Uh, then I'd do the plan. It would show me a long list, oh, probably uh, pages and pages and pages of information uh, that it would want me to do. And then I would do the apply. Uh, and so that's kind of the 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 idea uh, of working with these. Oh, and by the way, if you install in Visual Studio, if you install inside of Visual Studio the AWS console, which you can do, you can actually look at your different regions, uh, including the one that we're working in, which is Oregon West. And I can actually see that and follow this without having to even open up the AWS uh, management console to see if things were successful. I, I could also run the other commands, right, from the CLI to make sure that uh, those have been deployed as well. But that's kind of the the idea here. Uh, there are a lot of different pieces. Um, we need to understand, you know, the, the, the two main pieces, the resources that we want uh, and the data associated with it, which you're going to see down here, the policies and so on. Once we understand those, uh, it becomes fairly easy to uh, essentially deploy any kind of environment that we want on AWS. And Terraform keeps these up to date uh, relatively, uh, you know, within, you know, two to three months of uh, new services being deployed, there'll be new uh, types and modules that you can work with from Terraform. All right. That's basically all I have uh, for the session uh, today. And I do want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this very brief introduction to Terraform. I think that you can probably see very quickly the power that's involved in working with uh, Terraform over trying to do this manually or trying to use something like uh, the CDK and the additional costs that you would have there. Uh, the idea behind this is to make infrastructure as code as simple as possible. As the demand increases, we have ways of tracking what is changing within our environments through the Terraform state. And we have a simple way of redeploying, if required, the original uh, information that was used to create whatever resource it was uh, that we required in the cloud, whether it's on AWS or Azure or Google or on our own on-prem environments with VMs, Terraform really does give us a, a great solution to be able to deliver the requirements that we have today in an auditable way. I want to thank you, everybody. Uh, if you do have follow-up questions, you know, please uh, feel free to to ask them here. Uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes yet, uh, and I hope to see you again. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. Kevin's back. <laughs> tomorrow. Kevin's back again tomorrow. You get a double feature with Kevin Clement. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and also, I just wanted to thank um, Kevin for, for being here and delivering this great webinar tonight. And also to Miles Brown, another wonderful instructor of ours, for staffing some of the, the chats and putting in those links. Thanks. Yay. Go team. Um, and if I could just share real quick for anyone who may still be on. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my screen that has the class automation with Terraform and AWS EKS training. Um, this, this is the, the course that Kevin was talking about a little bit. Um, and it's available for private sessions, private classes. And if you need it to be customized, Kevin's really great at pinpointing exactly what you need um, and delivering it. Uh, but also, if you're just one or two people that need to get trained, we've got uh, USD 249. This is 60% off the normal rate. It's guaranteed to run. It's an online virtual class, hands-on, um, live instructor-led. It's running on December 9th. So if you're interested in that, you can just click that little enroll and get in there. Um, one other quick thing. We have recorded this webinar and we will be sending you the URL for the link. If you are interested in Kevin's uh, presentation and the, the slides, just let us know and we'll be very happy to send you those out. Um, all right. Well, I guess with that, um, I will sign off, send everybody out into the world, and hopefully we will see you tomorrow. Um, yes, thanks, for data Kevin, and, and learning. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. 
Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.